So, hey, uh, everybody. Many thanks for uh, attending our talk, remotely or physically. So today we'll talk to you about uh, Apache Cal site. As I said before, if you can follow, if you can spend a few minutes to follow these instructions, if you want to follow up uh, on the coding module afterwards, it's better to start now. So I'll leave it just a few seconds more. Then uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, coding environment, if you want, we suggest to use uh, IntelliJ, but it's, I mean, any, any ID that can load a Maven project should work fine as well. And uh, I will go again into the steps later if, if needed. So just um, spend a bit of time checking out the, the code and verifying. I, basically, it only requires uh, a Java version uh, greater than uh, eight and uh, nothing more. So you, it should be able to run. So just a few words uh, about us. My name is Tamadza Betakis. Currently, I work uh, at Cloudera, and I'm part of the Hive, Apache Hive Query Optimizer team. Uh, I have uh, roughly 10 years of experience uh, divided between uh, industry and academia, and it's mostly on uh, data management. Uh, I enjoy working on open source project, and uh, I really enjoy working um, in Apache Cal site, where I'm a PMC member, and I'm also uh, Committed for Apache Hive. Hi, I'm Julian Hyde. I uh, I was the original developer of CalSite. Um, I work in the Looker division at Google, and I founded I founded CalSite because I had written a few DBMS systems, both relational and non-relational, over the years, and I just got tired of doing it over and over again. So, CalSite is my attempt to never have to write another DBMS. So here is a small introduction of what we are going to, to see today. Uh, a brief introduction and motivation of what is CalSite and why do we need to use it. Then we are going to see a small, uh, really short demo of how we, ha we can have, uh, using CalSite, a CSV, uh, an SQL query processor over CSV files. Then we are going to, to work on, on the code, first coding module where we are going to build a, an SQL query processor from scratch. And there I will type at the same time as you. So hopefully in 20 to 30 minutes, we'll have a fully fledged query processor uh, implemented. And then um, uh, Julian will talk to you about uh, hybrid planning and how all the internals of uh, CalSite works. So basically some basic ideas about the Volcano Planner that CalSite uh, uses internally, and a very interesting stuff about uh, the various dialects that CalSight supports, materialized views, and uh, uh, interesting uh, work on special data. And last, we will close with uh, some uh, research projects that use CalSight uh, for research, or how you can use CalSight for research. And- uh, Can I interrupt? Yeah. So I think those last, those last few, I mean, we're, probably going to be short of time. So, so those last few, maybe when we get to, you know, section seven, we'll like take a vote and see which areas people want to focus on if, you know, if we're running short of time. But of course, you know, we'll be around afterwards and we're happy to, you know, answer questions and go through stuff in detail afterwards. And uh, we know we'll be keeping you from lunch. So we're going to try and end, you know, a little bit before one o'clock if we can. So let's assume that uh, uh, somebody wants to build uh, an application or a data management system that wants to uh, manage books, so a bookstore. And then uh, one of the main um, views that the client wants to have on his application is to be able to see, to retrieve uh, books and its authors. He wants to display the image title and some other information associated with the book. Usually we want them sorted by something, let's say on the ID for uh, uh, easiness. And then we don't want to display 1 million or 1 billion books. We want a certain group. So we will, let's say display the top five. So this is our motivation. We want to build this system. 
And uh, the question is, uh, how, uh, how do the data look or how, where do they store? Let's assume that we are dealing with, uh, let's say, mostly structured data. So something that resembles an entity, uh, an author with a few attributes, ID, first name, last name, and birth date, and a book with, again, ID, title, price, and year. Then we have many options. I mean, uh, we can, uh, the data can be in XML files. The data can be in CSV, JSON. And apart from that, as we have seen previously, there are really too many data management systems available today. So we have to, to pick which one we want to use. And for different uh, reasons, each one picks a different every time. And at, the, at this moment, I think DB ranking has more than 360 DBMS listed uh, in their database. So for this, let's assume that uh, the architect that wanted to build the application decided that uh, Lucene, Lucene, Apache Lucene is the best uh, management system that uh, will to host uh, books and authors. It can be realistic because we may want to search, uh, we perform text search over the pages and find some pages in the book uh, and then retrieve the book. So Apache Lucene is an open source uh, search engine. It's also a Java library and it has, it provides powerful indexing and uh, search features. It also has a, uh, many features related to text search, like spell checking, hit highlighting, and other uh, uh, features like tokenization and um, other stuff. Interestingly, it also supports uh, ACID transactions. So you can really build a DBMS on top of, uh, of Apache Lucene quite easily. And another reason that you may use Lucene is because it has a very compact uh, format for storing data into memory and disk. So the following, uh, the coding modules, we'll, we'll try to build this. So the question is now, okay, we know the, where the data is. The data, let's say, are in Lucene and we want to get them back. So if we want to translate the, the natural language request to something that uh, can be executed over Lucene, we can think of it. I mean, one of the easiest things that we could do is to write an SQL query but uh, that res resembles that the one you can see on your screen. The thing is that um, Lucene does not provide an SQL uh, API. It has some uh, APIs that will allow you to execute queries, but it does not support, uh, it does not uh, natively support joins. It does not natively support complex aggregations, uh, window functions, and other, fu uh, and, uh, and other um, uh, very useful features of SQL. So if we want to, uh, to have the possibility of create such views. And I mean, in an application, we will not have only one view, so it will not be a hard-coded query. We'll have many queries. So in the end, what we will need, we'll need a kind of query processor. So we give the query, we have a parser that parses the query to some kind of uh, relational algebra. And this uh, gets optimized by the planner by applying rules like uh, projection pushdown, uh, filter, filter pushdown, and other well-known optimizations. And with the help of statistics, like uh, metadata and statistics, like uh, cardinalities, uh, filter selectivity, and other interesting information, maybe we have also constraints available for the tables, the planner will pick the best plan, will, uh, will perform some equivalent transformations, and will generate another uh, plan, a relation, another algebraic expression. Then depending on what our engine is, in this case, it will be Lucene, the, the plan can be executed to something that Lucene or another system can understand in order to give us back uh, the results. And now, if we want to build a query processor, this, I mean, I read somewhere that it's about 10 years of engineering, 10 engineering years in order to build a full uh, commercially available uh, SQL processor. And this is where CalSight comes into play. So CalSight, uh, of course, is an Apache project found it on 2015, and it provides all the necessary primitives, all the necessary components in order to build a query processor from scratch with very few lines of code. So in this case, we'll build a quite, uh, uh, we'll build a, a fully fledged query processor over Lucene in roughly less than 600 lines of code. And essentially we'll go over this, uh, this is the architecture of CalSight, so we have um, 
uh, the SQL query that comes, it passes from the SQL parser, it validates that the structure is correct, and it generates the AST. Then the HST is uh, received by, by the SQL validator that uh, using the, the schema and the catalog reader will derive the type information. It will validate that, uh, let's say, the, the tables that are mentioned in the query are correct. The identifiers, uh, the column names do appear in the schema and other information and will generate a validated uh, AST, so another SQL node. Forgot to say that this is uh, all uh, correspond exactly to the names of the CalSite APIs. So everything that you see in this slide, you can find it in the code. If you look for this, these specific interfaces, you will find them there. So we have a validated AST, and this will pass from the SQL to REL converter that will take the AST and will transform it to algebraic expressions. So to a logical, let's say, plan. Then by applying some rules and exploiting uh, statistics, information about constraints, or any kind of other custom metadata that uh, someone may provide, we'll get to another relational expression that we usually refer to as a physical plan. I mean, and uh, at the end, depending on uh, where we are going to execute the query, this plan uh, will, trans will be transformed to the equivalent executable plan in the respective engine and will provide us back uh, with the results. Yeah, if there are questions, you can uh, interrupt now or uh, at the end as you want. So the, just to say that uh, usually all these are provided by CalSight, all these uh, APIs, and most often what we need to change or what we need to touch in order to, to make it work for any kind of uh, uh, underlying engine like Lucene, We'll have to possibly introduce some uh, custom rules, some to, to perform some more efficient optimization or to add something that does not exist. We'll probably need to introduce maybe some custom operators, although it's not necessarily required, physical operators. And then, of course, we need to provide a way for CalSight to know what are the tables, what are uh, the, what is the schema actually, so how we can read uh, that a query is correct. So here I will just show you how uh, CalSight can be used to, uh, to query uh, CSV data. So CalSight provides the notion of adapter, which is actually the underlying engine where we're going to execute the query. And we have the CSV adapter, where you can uh, implement a factory, a schema factory, to explain how you want to read the tables from somewhere. In this case, uh, we'll use, let's say, this uh, file schema factory that you can see on the JSON uh, snippet that uh, reads actually the schema from uh, the existing file. So it reads a directory in the file system. So as you see here, the operand, which is a directory, and it says a bookstore. So with this, you are saying that to Calci that check in this directory, in the bookstore directory, and each file there will correspond to a table. And the first line will denote the schema. So without uh, nothing more, you, can, you are ready to execute SQL queries over CSV files. And let's see it in practice. So here I'm uh, in the repository of CalSight. They check out the code of CalSight. And I will try to run uh, SQL line, which is a command line interface that is not directly uh, related to CalSight, but it's available and we provide it uh, as a dependency. And then uh, we connect, SQL line can be used to connect to any a JDBC uh, data source. And in this case, what we will do, we'll connect to CalSight. So we say connect JDBC CalSight. And then we will provide a model. So we'll provide this small uh, JSON snippet that you have seen previously in the slides which contains the, the model about the bookstore example. So we don't need username and password to connect. And now we are uh, connected to CalSight, let's say. So we can uh, execute command tables to show the existing tables in the schema. And as we can see, we have the two tables of our example, the author and, uh, and book. And these were read automatically by CalSight by exploiting the information uh, 
in the file schema factory. And now we are ready to, to run any kind of query. So let's run, uh, run uh, query zero, which is uh, the query that we have seen initially, which is a join of book with authors on the, the common uh, ID with an order by the book ID and uh, limit five. And we can see that we get back the results that we have seen uh, initially. So this is uh, uh, just a sample query to show you that everything works. And uh, in principle, you can, you can execute any kind of query with aggregation, with complex window functions. It will just work. And if we want to see the plan, how does the plan look like? So. I will just set first the output format to have something more readable for the plan. And then I will learn an explain plan. So I'm just launching the explain, the explain plan from the same query. And what we can see is that we have, uh, uh, let's start from the bottom. So we have the scan of uh, the book table and the author table. Then we see that there is a sort operator on top of the book, which seems that the sort, there were optimization rules that push the sorts down really on top of the book along with the limit. Then we are joining them using an enumerable hash join, which can be thought as an in-memory hash join. And we finish by again, uh, limiting, getting only the five top results and projecting, uh, projecting the right columns. So enumerable calc uh, is an operator that can be used for performing both uh, projections and uh, projection and filtering, selection and filtering. So let me get back to, to the slides. Yeah. Any questions so far? Maybe you need to come to mind. So I, I wanted to say that, that that plan, which is using things like innumerable source, innumerable calc, um, that's a basic implementation of relational algebra that internally just generates temporary Java classes. So, and they are basically iterators. So it's a very inefficient single threaded implementation of relational algebra. It kind of comes out of the box in CalCite so we can run queries against anything. It's not the only implementation as we'll see later. Um, there's other, you know, many other implementations you can plug in your own implementation of relational algebra. So this is just a basic one, just, you know, to get you going. So the first step, now we are passing to the hands-on. So we are going to type to create the, uh, with Java, uh, the SQL query processor. So the three things that we need at the beginning is the three, the three main interfaces that is the schema, the CalSite schema, which uh, allows us to, allows CalSite to know which tables are used, um, uh, should be used by the query processor. Then we have the table interface that uh, among others, the most uh, important thing is to be able to tell what is the data type, how does it look? I mean, uh, uh, what columns does it have and uh, to what uh, data types they correspond? So we have the ID that will be an integer, we have the name that will be a varcar, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to provide a CalSide a way to know what kind of information are in the schema. And then uh, we have the, that, the type factory, the real data type factory, which, allow, which can be used to create uh, data types for the tables for, uh, and for other uh, cases. So, uh, the data by factory, CalSite by default provides uh, two implementations. And it provides, the, for example, the one that we are going to use in, the, uh, in this case will be the Java type factory, which based on the Java class, it can create the equivalent, let's say, type for CalSite. So the two interesting methods that we will need in this tutorial will be the create Java type and create SQL type. So now I am in, um, uh, I uh, will start the coding tutorial. So if you build, um, if you already built the project, then uh, you're in the, uh, the main directory. So what do we, know, we want to do at first? 
is uh, create our Lucene, index, uh, Lucene indexes so that we are able to execute queries. So at the moment, uh, the directory looks like a bit like this. And I will run the indexer. So I'm just uh, uh, running Java jar and the uh, indexer jar with dependencies. And then this uh, should create uh, uh, this should create the indexes in the target directory. So as we can see, we have the target directory with TPCAs and all the tables inside. So if I just browse one table and I do LS, this is just uh, something uh, really dependent to Lucene. It's how Lucene internally stores its data. So it's not something that we can understand. It's compressed, it's uh, optimized for, uh, for Lucene. So now we have our indexes ready. And just to show you a bit uh, how, does, how we do it, just not to say that everything is magically happens. I will open the dataset indexer, which performs the indexing in Lucene. In Lucene. So here we are not doing anything in, uh, specifically. We are taking every TPCH table that is located in, uh, in some path, in some hard-coded path in uh, data set location, TPCH, and the table name. And then what we do is uh, create a Lucene directory. So we set the mode for writing to Lucene. Uh, this will be created since we are going to override the index every time. Just, it's just for demonstration purposes, so it doesn't matter. And then what we are going to do is read uh, uh, our TPCH table from CSV, split it based on the delimiter. So we have here, we have one row of the first table of the customer table, let's say. And then we create uh, the equivalent of uh, a row in Lucene, which is a document. So we create a document and then for each column that we have for the ID, first name, last name, we are going to put, oh, sorry, we are going to put uh, the value in Lucene. And then we are going to just uh, add the row in the Lucene index and we are done. And we will commit in the end. So just a small detail. I mean, uh, I told you that Lucene offers many, many kinds of indexing data. And among those, it offers uh, very efficient KD trees, KD tree indexes, which is similar to, to B trees, but multidimensional. And uh, this is what uh, in point here does. So it says that for a column that is of type uh, integer, I want to, to, to index it, to store it in Lucene as a single dimensional uh, KD tree uh, index. So this is why you see in point here. Again, this is specific to Lucene and uh, Lucene is not our focus today. So I'll not spend more time on this thing. And I will go to the Lucene query processor, which is located in the tablet template module. The reason that we have, uh, as you can see, uh, we have two query processors. One is the, on the table mo template module and one is on the solution. So the template is what we are going to do now. So I'm going to type uh, live. And the solution is for those who want to check how the code should look like afterwards, or they are not in the mood to type now, they can find the, the solution there. So let's start by creating uh, the schema. So we create a CalSite schema, which is an implementation of uh, the interface provided by CalSite. As we said, we need a type factory to create uh, the types for the tables. So we have the type factory that, and we'll use one of the implementations provided by CalSite, which is a Java type factory. And then what we have to do is to create the data type, the, the data type for each uh, table, for each uh, TPCH table. So we iterate over the TPCH tables and we are going to do some work. So this is to say that in this case, we are going to create uh, the, the schema by starting from, uh, by, uh, but by starting by an, an enum, by an enumeration. So the TPCH table is just a, an enumeration that holds uh, the tables 
column and a type. This could be a JSON file. This could be any kind of uh, input that you want. So it's up to uh, the developer to select how he wants to build the model. Usually we, had, we have it available in some form and we have to make it available to CalSci. So in this case, we have it available as a Java class. So what we need to do is to iterate through the enumeration and start building a, our tables and their types. So we'll create a, a builder for the, from the type factory to use for its table. And for each column of the table, we are going to create the appropriate type. So I take the table, I take each column, and then what I need to do is add uh, the name of the type. So in this case will be the column name and the actual type. So I will use the type factory to create a Java type that is again in the enumeration. And to keep things a bit constant, I will get the SQL type name to kind of have SQL types for the table. So now I have uh, created that, let's say the type for, uh, for the table. And what I need to do is I want uh, to add the table to the schema. So here I have, I will uh, add the table to the schema. So I'll just use the name of the table here. And then we need to pass uh, an implementation of uh, the table interface in CalSci. So if we check the, uh, the table interface in CalSci, it, like, it is like that. So it, the main thing as we've seen is to be able to provide to, to its uh, users the row type the real data type for, its, uh, for the columns. Then it can provide some additional information like uh, statistics, uh, cardinalities uh, and other information, the type of the table, and then uh, some other uh, information uh, related to rollout. But we don't, we don't have to implement all of this. So if we check, we are going to use, in this case, a Lucene table, since we are going to, uh, to have some specificities regarding to Lucene. And the Lucene table right now just needs two things. So it just needs uh, uh, the path to the index. So where in the file system did we store our, our, um, our table and the data type that we constructed right now. So here we are going to pass the index path. which is located to, as we've seen, to target. Then we have the TPCH dataset. And under the TPCH dataset, we have uh, the table name. So here we have our index path. And uh, we have also our, uh, the, the, table, uh, the table type. And we are ready to go. So here, Lucene table is one kind of table. Another kind of table could be JDBC, which knows how to uh, deal with data from JDBC connections, or Cassandra table, which knows how to deal with things in Cassandra. So this is a, something that needs to be implemented, usually needs to be implemented by the developer. So at this point, we have, uh, we have, construct, uh, we have created our schema, and we are ready to parse our query. So we'll create the SQL parser. And what we are going to pass is uh, the SQL query that we read from the input. So the main class just uh, reads a file that contains an SQL query and parses everything to, to a string. So here we pass the SQL query to the parser and we call parse to see if there are uh, errors. So this is will generate the AST as we have seen. And now we can print, uh, we can try to print the parsed query 
to see if uh, what we have done till now. So I will try to execute this. And what I see is that I see that the query was parsed correctly and it shows what it was given as an input. So what just uh, one small information, in order to, la to run uh, the processor, you can do it uh, through the IntelliJ, through the ID. So you have the, the main class, which is the Lucene query processor, the argument, which is the file that contains a query that the query that you want to execute. So we have query zero, this located in the queries TPCH folder. And then we are ready to run it. So if you run by console, then you are doing the same thing. You are you will type Java minus jar, you go to the template directory, target, you'll find the jar, and uh, you'll provide the, the SQL file. So the SQL looks like this. What happens now is that uh, yeah, the SQL looks like this. So if now let's say that we uh, the SQL was a bit more formed. So instead of select, we have the select, and we try to run again the parser. We'll see that uh, it fails because it doesn't find a query expression. So there is uh, it indicates that there's a problem in parsing the query. At the same time, if at this point we we make an error. On the um, on the column name or in a table name, what do you think it will happen? So the parser finishes successfully, and it says that there is no problem because actually it doesn't. It is not. It is not connected to the schema. So the parser is able to validate the structure, but it's not validate to uh, the presence of tables, columns, or type information. This is the job of the validator. So let's go back to our query processor class. We created the SQL parser, we parsed the query successfully, and we have the AST. So let me go just briefly back to the slides. So what we did is we took the initial SQL query, we parsed it, and we have something that looks like this. The AST right uh, one uh, mapping uh, with the query. So whatever is in the query, it's also in the AST. But this is a convenient interpret and intermediate interpretation till we get to the next step. So as the next step, we want to pass it from the validator. So before that, let's uh, create the catalog reader. That is the interface that provides, that can connect with the validator. So for the catalog reader, we need to provide the schema that we had before. If there are multiple sub schemas, we have to provide some additional information. In this case, uh, we don't need to provide anything because our root schema is also the main schema and we have nothing more. We need to provide a type factory and uh, a config uh, some configuration. That's the default for now. So we create the catalog reader and we're about to create the validator. So there are parameters. First is uh, the operator table, which is another important interface, but we are not going to focus a lot today because we don't have much time, which allows to the, the validator to know which operators are available to, uh, to the system. So for instance, you have uh, uh, equals is an operator, less than is an operator. And there are many, many other similar operators and you can also add your own. If you have uh, custom uh, user defined functions, you can extend the, the operator table. So at this point, we'll just use the standard uh, operator table that contains all the standard, operate, all the SQL standard operators. We'll pass the catalog reader that we created previously, the type factory, and a default. Now let's validate uh, our AST. So we'll pass our parse AST here. 
and we will have the valid AST, let's say, as an output. Again, let's try to print this so that we see that we it is it passed successfully the validation. So and let's try to run it again. So as we have seen, as you may notice, is that at this point we get a, a validator exception that says that the, the column customer key could not be found in any table. And the suggestion is that, did you mean? Oh, yeah, it does not allow me to go, <laughs> okay. So it suggests that you use a lowercase. So what it means is that it cannot find this column in the schema. So this is a configuration uh, problem. So here, when we configure the catalog reader, we have many options. So what we can do, for instance, is we can provide an alternative conf configuration. Starting from the default one. And making, uh, turning off case sensitivity. So now customer key in lowercase and in uh, uppercase will be the same thing. And now normally it should be validated. So as you have seen, we have our parsed query and we have also our validated query. And as before, if I change the name of a table in the query, it will not parse the validator. So at this step, the query is valid. So our next step is to go from the AST to, to an algebraic expression, or in other words, to a logical plan. As you have seen, the AST is quite complex. It's a, something that we cannot easily perform optimization, and it's not that have any mathematical uh, uh, basis. On the other hand, the relational algebra is based on uh, years of research, and we, have, we know many kinds of optimization rules that can, can be applied. And it's also much easier to understand. So from this AST, we have the SQL to red converter that's going to pass, uh, to go through the AST and generate the plan that we see on the right. So we'll start by creating what is called uh, optimization cluster, which holds uh, uh, planning information, which holds information during planning. So now we are able to create the SQL to rent converter. So the first argument is uh, if we have views, if we have views in our schema, we need a way to expand them. In this case, we are not using views, so I will just use uh, an expander that does nothing. So you see it's basically just returning null then we need to pass the validator the catalog reader the optimization cluster and finally a default again a default configuration for uh, for the converter oh. yeah i missed the converter table, the SQL Rex converter table. So this converter table does some uh, normalization of uh, expressions. So if we have uh, of row expressions, so if we have, let's say, a K statement, or we have a coalesce expression, we rewrite coalesce to case. So we this kind of uh, Convert the table does some kind of normalization for expressions. And in CalSite, what I didn't say, we have two kind of um, main classes. So we have the rel node, which is the relational expressions, which is the logical sort, logical project, filter, etc. And we have what we call rex node. So it is row expression, which is basically what, how we express filters and how we express projections, et cetera. So these are the main things. And the converted table here 
refers to row expressions, to, to Rex nodes. So now we can get the logical plan. So we pass the valid AST. We say that it doesn't need validation because it's already validated. And we say that it is a top level query expression. So we pass through here. And now it should normally display the logical plan. We should have the logical plan, which is the rel node. So let's try to display this information. We are going to use a utility class to dump the plan. So we just pass uh, some header, logical plan, let's say. We pass uh, the constructed rel node. And then we have multiple ways to serialize the plan, to see the plan. So we will use text in this case. We have also other alternatives. And then we can specify how detailed we want the, the plan to be. So if we need minimal information, we will pass explain plan attributes. So if we now run this, we'll see that uh, it was parsed, the query was parsed, validated, and we have uh, our logical plan that we have seen also in the slides, which is a very simple query with sort, project, filter, and a join of two tables. Now that we are, uh, now that we are done with a logical plan, we need a way to execute this somehow. So we need to go from uh, logical operators somehow to uh, physical operators. And apart from that, we, um, and we are going to apply some rules. So here we are going to apply a one-to-one -one rule. Uh, uh, the rules that we are going to use here are one-to-one -one mapping. So from a logical sort, we go to an enumerable sort. There are other cases where two logical operators can correspond or more can correspond to one physical operators. So we'll get our planner, which was also created during when we created our cluster. In this case, it's a volcano planner. There are various other alternatives that uh, Julian will, is going to talk to you about later. And we need to, uh, to introduce the rules. So as we said, we need, uh, we have a big bunch of rules available in CalSight. So now we'll just do the basic, no optimization, but just really going from logical to something that we can execute. Oops, sorry. So we pass a local sort to enumerable project, so on and so forth. So now we have all the rules available to transform our logical plan to a physical plan. And what is left to do is to try to, because we have a Volcano planner, we have to say uh, what kind of uh, physical attribute we want our plan uh, to have, or in other words, what kind of calling convention. Again, this is not something that you need to understand now because uh, there is uh, extended slides afterwards that are going to talk about the conversion, but it just want to say that here we, we ask our plan to be in the enumerable calling convention. So it, to be a, a, a plan with these physical properties, let's say. So here we define that we want the plan in this, with these properties. We set the plan to be ready for optimization. And then we kick off the project. So we so our physical plan should be in the enumerable convention because we requested this explicitly from the optimizer. 
So when the planner finds the best expression, the best equivalent expression, we are sure that it's going to be um, an operator in the numerical conversion. So this is the main interface. You can see there are all these kinds of operations. So we have Ableton, uh, short, much, and many, many others. Now let's try to, again, with the same way as before, display the physical plan. And let's see what we get. So at this point, there will be a very common an, an exception that you will definitely encounter when you start playing with calcite, which is the cannot plan exception. <laughs> and basically, what that, it says that it says that there are not enough rules to produce a node with uh, the desired properties. So we requested our output to be in the numerical convention, but the Volcano Planner wasn't able to do that. And it gives us a bit more info about that. It gives us, it says that there are some empty, uh, some expressions that couldn't be transformed. And as we can see, it couldn't, it says that it couldn't transform the table scan, the logical table scan to enumerable, both of them. And why is that? The, this is why, because the enumerable table scan rule cannot handle any kind of table. So this is the, the rule. And if we go to the method that does a transformation, let's say we can see that it checks the type of the table. And if it is an instance of a querable table, or if it can derive an expression, then it, it will transform it to an enumerable table scan. If it cannot, then it will return null. In this case, our table doesn't uh, implement anything, doesn't implement the querable table interface or something else. So it just fails. This we can easily fix it for the moment. So we'll go back to our Lucent table. So here, as you can see, it only extends abstract table, which is a basic implementation. And how we can solve the problem and execute this over uh, with an enumerable table scan, we are going to implement another interface, which is the scannable interface. This interface actually says that if you want to implement uh, you can uh, uh, implement this, uh, you can run with this table, you can create a plan with, with this table. If you provide a way to tell uh, how you, I can uh, get the data out with how I can scan the data and provide an enumerable object. So in this case, what we need to do is just implement this method. So, okay, let me, before implementing this method, if I run again uh, the planner, I will see that the, uh, it generates the proper physical plan. So no problem. As soon as it says that there is a way to get the data out and the table is the appropriate one, the, the Volcano planner can derive the plan. Now we just have to complete the missing bits. So Lucen enumerable is a class that uh, requires a parameter to the index that we already have as part of the table. It requires also to specify a mapping between the fields of the table and the equivalent uh, data type in CalSight. So we need to do a small initialization here. So we, we have the data type, but we, we have to make Lucene enumerable know about it. So for its uh, field of the data type, we are going to populate the map and we are passing the name and the type. 
so that when we, yeah, I will explain later. And then the last parameter of the Lucene enumerable is uh, a query. So a query that can be understood by Lucene. So the parser of Lucene recognizes this as a select all, let's say. So this query for in Lucene terms, it means give me back uh, all the results from the table. So this implementation is very basic. So it will ju just uh, open uh, the, the index, the Lucene index in this specific path. It will perform, it will use the search uh, API that is the main API for querying Lucene. And it will pass the select all, uh, the select all query. And then it will generate uh, rows that it will put into a list and it will create, uh, it will load actually the whole table, the whole Lucent table into memory to something that Calcite can understand. So it's a very naive implementation of getting data out of Lucene, but it's just for dem demonstration purposes. So now we can, uh, there is a way to know how to take data out. So there is a last bit that needs to be done in our query processor is to actually run it. So generate the executable plan and run it. So in order to get the executable plan, you don't need to understand all the details, but if you call this method, it will be able to pass uh, and you pass the physical plan, which is here, you will be able to get back uh, the executable plan. As, as Julian mentioned before, the numerable operators are uh, just are combined and then they generate a piece of Java code. And then this Java code is executed to give you back the results. So let's try to run this. So, As you can see here, we said that uh, we prefer the output to be an array. So we prefer our output rows to be an array. So each row is an, ob an object array. So when we execute the plan, it will give us back rows in form of a, an object array. So let's print out. the results and now if I didn't do a mistake after the physical plan we should be able to see yeah the last thing that is missing so when it tries to run the, the enumerable plan as we can see here it bumps into an unsupported operation exception so the hint is located here so if you go here to this method where it throws exception it says that in enumerable calc is always better so in a variable clock, it's always better than project. So it's a, the reason is that in a project and in a filter can be combined into one operator. So it's always more efficient to transform to a calc that can at the same time perform projection and filter than have two separate implementations. So this is easy to fix. We are going to add two kinds of uh, logical rules, which says that a filter transform it to calc and a project also transform it to calc operator. And, and then instead of using project and filter in our planning, we can use the enumerable calc operator. And this is, if you remember the initial uh, demo of the CSV adapter is why you were seeing enumerable calc and you were not seeing enumerable project on enumerable filter. So now you have a complete SQL query processor. I don't know how much time I took, but it should be under 30 minutes. 
And uh, as you can see, we have uh, but we get back back all our results. This is a very basic thing, but we can see in the process how we can make this much more efficient. But the idea is that with very uh, few primitives, you can go back. Uh, you can uh, create an SQL processor with uh, by using CalSign. Uh, yes, so the question was uh, how you can combine these uh, Java based operators, if I understood well, with other kind of languages that do, are not necessarily Java, like C or uh, something else, right? So if you're talking about how, because the enumerable operators, for instance, this uh, will generate Java code, but uh, there is nothing that tells you that they can generate another kind. They can generate C++ code if you want. So you can, you can have a C++ enumerable, or C++ project that generates a C++ code or, or another kind of thing. At some point, if for whatever reason, you need some part to be done in Java, then you need to have a, a converter that we are going to see right afterwards, how does it work? But uh, yeah, there is a connecting piece uh, depending on what you need to do. So if your engine, underlying engine is fully C++, then you can only execute the C++ code. You can generate C++ code and you're done. I don't know. Can I, can yeah. I answer that? So some people use CalSite as a kind of planning as a service. So you can give it either a SQL query or you can give it a JSON representation of a logical plan and it will apply its rules and will give you a another plan back, a physical plan for whatever engine you want. So the, at its heart, CalSite is a relational algebra toolkit, and its its job is to produce a relational plan, a, a plan in whatever calling convention you want. And so you could you should think of that plan as kind of being a blob of JSON. In this case, you know we've made it enumerable convention because we want to. We think you'd like to see data. You know it makes for a better demo. But uh, I mean, for example, Stamatis works on Hive, and you know is. His, in his day job, he is using CalSite to produce plans that can execute in Hive as, you know, MapReduce or uh, TES, TES tasks. Does that answer the question? Yes. yes. We are talking please wait, wait, wait a second, please. Um, maybe this is a silly question, but we are talking about uh, read-only queries, or you can support even insertion or modification? Yeah, we, um, so one of our relational operators is called a table modify. And so that, that which is, it's always occurs at the root of the tree. In other words, it's the last thing that happens, but that can be an insert, an update, or a delete. So if you feed a sequence of rows into a, let's say an insert operator, then it will go and insert into a, insert into a table. Does that make sense? I wanted to just uh, kind of recap over something. So we talked a lot about adapters. So an adapter is basically provides all the information necessary for CalSite to connect to another source of data. In this case, it was Lucene. Um, and it, provide, it needs to provide three pieces of information. If you just think of you know, what CalSite needs to know in order to query Lucene, three pieces of information. Number one, it needs to know what tables and columns there are in this, in this data source. Uh, and we did that using the schema factory. Number two, it needs to be able to actually run time, connect to this thing and, and scan a table. That's a, a minimum. And then number three, which is kind of an optional extra is it needs um, some rules that can optimize queries, things like push down filters, push down projects, push down aggregations, and also kind of declare the capabilities of that, that engine. So those are the three things that comprise an adapter. And the kind of three is the, the last one is the most interesting because by using rules, a set of rules, you can basically declare to CalSite what the capabilities of that engine are. Um, a lot of kind of simple, uh, you know, 
data connectivity systems, they allow you to push down projects and filters and that's it. But the, the calcite model of an adapter is very powerful because you can basically using, use by defining a set of rules, you can basically tell it, tell it um, any combination of relational operations that this engine can be implemented. Any more questions? Yes, one more question here. And uh, our remote audience, please don't hesitate to ask questions too. Does Calcite assume a row-wise tuple layout, or could I also build, for example, a columnar database on top of that? Uh, yeah, the physical or organization of the data is uh, really doesn't it doesn't care. I mean, the, if if it is a column-oriented database, um, then the cost model is going to be different. Certain operations will have a different cost model, but uh, yeah, as long as it implements a plan which looks like you know, as long as it has a physical algebra, then yeah, we can support it. Thank you. Should we push on? Yeah, I think as it's 1230, should we push through this next module? And uh, Yeah, I mean, this is a just uh, exercises uh -huh. so that, uh, yeah, these were not meant to be done now. But you, afterwards, if you follow the tutorial or if you are willing to do it uh, offline, uh, there are a few exercises, like uh, try to execute more queries, see what, we are, what problems you are going to bump into. There are also the solutions in the slides that we are going to publish. There are also some this exercise that tells you, try to introduce some rules in, by the, using the default uh, CalSite library. Like in this case, the filter was on top of the join. Try to find the rule that pushes the filter below the join. And the last one that tries to, to show that shows that apart from SQL, like we have SQL as an input, but there is not our own only option. So we have the rel, another very, very uh, useful API, which is the rel builder API. And with this one, you can create uh, the equivalent of a relational uh, expression. So you can create a, a logical plan, let's say, by performing some calls. So this is again as an exercise where you try to transform these queries, uh, you try to use the rel builder to construct the equivalent of these queries. So there are to-dos in the code and there are uh, other stuff that can help you out. And of course we are here for, or now, or uh, uh, via email afterwards to answer whatever comes up. So, up to you. Thanks, Tamatis. He's much better at typing code while he talks than I am. So I'm going to show nice diagrams that are animated. Um, I think we've spoken about calling convention already, um, but let me just explain it in more detail. So um, calling convention is the, like the, the physical format of the data and how it's processed, how it's passed from one operator to another. So, um, you know, enumerable calling convention um, represents a plan where the de what, one row is passed. It used to be called the, the volcano execution model where each operator calls its input operator and says, get row. And that row comes back as a Java row. That's the, that's the basic idea of innumerable convention. You could have something like Spark convention where the operators talk to each other because we've generated a Spark program. So everything starts off in logical convention, which basically is, you know, the raw relational algebra, but no particular implementation in mind. Um, and so because there's no implementation, every node has infinite cost. Um, so now let's suppose that we've, we've connected to some, you know, we've, this is a, a, a three-way a three join. Um, and we've got, uh, We've, we've, colored, we've, we've just given arbitrary colors to the convention. So we've got two tables that are in blue. Let's imagine that these are, uh, I don't know, leucine tables. And one table in green, let's imagine that's, uh, I don't know, a MySQL database and we're accessing it via JDBC. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, so because these are of the same, same convention, 
then potentially we can we can create groups of operators that can all kind of execute in a single process and, and efficiently pass the data between them. So um, what tends to happen as we are planning is we are applying transformation rules that will make the decision to uh, convert uh, these logical nodes into the equivalent nodes of that uh, convention, if it has it, right? Some, so Lucene's probably a bad example because Lucene doesn't have a join. It's not able to implement join. Um, but you know, most conventions implement at least a few of the relational operators. So as we go up, we're gradually kind of coloring the tree in. We've, we've decided that it's at least a, possible, a possibility to implement this, you know, this filter in balloon convention. Um, we're using the volcano engine, which uh, basically is, uh, is, is able to apply this set of rules um, and use dynamic programming to find a, uh, you know, a viable plan that has the lowest cost. So there we are, we've colored on the entire tree. And let, let, let me just go into some more details about how we did that. So um, we've inserted these nodes here, the blue to logical converter, the green to logical converter. So in order, we have checks and balances in, in, the, in the optimizer that basically says a node has to have, uh, you know, if, 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 if we are a blue, a blue join and the inputs need to be blue, right? So we have to, kind of at, at the junction points between the different conventions, we have to insert these um, converters, which is a relational expression whose only job is to convert something from one convention to another. And it doesn't really exist. It's just, it, just keeps, it just keeps us honest. Um, but we can write transformation rules. So for example, the blue filter rule is something that looks for a logical filter on top of a blue, uh, uh, subplan. Um, and this rule will match this particular pattern here, the filter on top of the blue to logical. And what does it do? It um, basically uh, converts the filter blue and now the converter is above. So this is the process by which we propagate the um, calling conventions throughout the tree. Um, another thing that happens is uh, you've got uh, some conventions are basically for source systems, um, you know, like JDBC is a data source, um, Lucene is a data source, but there are some um, calling conventions, which I refer to as engines, which is um, they are systems which don't actually store data, but they're capable of doing computation. So Spark is an example of an engine, right? Presto is an example of an engine, Flink. Um, and so often in these hybrid plans, which have uh, data of different sources, uh, we have another, uh, and, and by the way, enumerable is another engine in that it, in that it's pro, it processes data in a single thread in Java. So um, uh, we often, in these hybrid plans, we often, often have an engine that's part of the plan, which is where the, the uh, operations occur that's combining data from two, two or more conventions. So orange is an example of an engine convention. So this is, this is how we get to a hybrid plan. Um, let me see. Can you talk us through this? Yeah. 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 And any so, questions on that before we, before we move on? So before that, I mean, uh, in the initial example, we had uh, a plan fully of, uh, full of innumerable operators. And as we have seen, I mean, the, the access to the Lucene was done basically by a full scan, load everything in memory, and then uh, execute the rest of the operators. Now there is a way to do it more efficiently. And the way to do it more efficiently is to push things that Lucene can handle. So as we said, Lucene has very powerful indexes. So many, many kinds of filters can be pushed in Lucene. So in this case, we, can't, we could introduce our own uh, Lucene convention, call it convention, as we have innumerable Spark or whatever. And we can start creating custom operators and rules to go from one uh, to the other. So we had our initial plan that looks like the plan on the left, which is everything is on enumerable. And we want to get to the plan uh, on the right, which is part of uh, Lucene and part of enumerable. So we can push the things that we can push in Lucene, and then we leave the rest for the enumerable operators. So in order to do that, I'm, I'm not going to do it now due to lack of time, but this is also again made for you that you can try out uh, on your own is you need to do a few steps. 
that are always that are detailed in the code that you have in the repository. So there are to-dos on each and every class that you can fill in. And this there is also the solution. If you cannot manage to arrive and see what's what I have to do next, you go and you check in the solution. But the idea is this: you, you, you introduce, you need to introduce three custom operators. So the first is the Lucene table scan, the second is the Lucene filter. And the third one is the Lucene to enumerable converter. So all the Lucene operators are able to transform to, to things that the Lucene API can, uh, can understand. So the main Lucene API is the query API. So it can take like this column zero less than three and it can translate to a Lucene filter. But then in order to combine the things that are from enumerable, that enumerable knows how to generate Java code to run things. So the Lucene to enumerable converter has to generate Java code and call the Lucene APIs. So the, basically the steps that you need to follow is this one. So you first to introduce the table scan, and then you have to introduce the rule that goes from a logical table scan, not to an enumerable, but to a Lucene table scan. So exact details can be found in the repos. I will not go through them. And the steps that can be found here. So for any questions, you can find me afterwards or send me an email to me or uh, Julian afterwards. So let me see, we've got 20 minutes left. Um, I think we have time for like one module. So Volcano internals, what are the other two? There's spatial query processing and I've forgotten. Uh, what's that? Oh yes, right, dialects. So are there, are there any votes? Who wants to see, uh, who would like to see Volcano? A review of the volcano planner, how that works. Let's have a show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. How many people would like to see uh, uh, how CalSite handles dialect, SQL dialects? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, it's close, six, seven. I think that one slightly. Uh, and then who's interested in uh, seeing how CalSite works with spatial data? Okay, I think dialects one. So um, these slides, by the way, are, I just posted them on SlideShare um, and I'll tweet out a link to those on, on Julian Hyde. So if you guys wanna look through the, the, those sections of the slides, then uh, you know, feel free. And by the way, if you find me in a bar tonight, I'm happy to <laughs> go over the, the modules that we haven't covered. Um, so dialects. Okay, so um, this is a yeah a, a, a diagram of CalSite's architecture, pretty similar to what Stamatis showed earlier. Um, so um, CalSite parses SQL, it validates it, translates it into relational algebra, applies rewrite rules, and then those rewrite rules will basically generate a plan for a number of adapters. Um, so where, th where throughout the stack do the notion of languages or dialects exist? Well, obviously, you know, in the SQL parser, that's, that's an obvious one, but there are some other places where, uh, and by the, by the when I'm talking about dialect support, I'm talking about is CalSite able to understand um, a query which was originally intended for Oracle? Um, is it able to generate a query if it's querying Postgres? Is it able to generate uh, a SQL query in, uh, in you know, using po Postgres's name for the substring function, using Postgres's data types, that kind of stuff. Um, so um, let's just look at the parser for a minute. What knobs am I able to turn? So this particular query, there's lots of components in there where the, where the parser has to make a decision. So for example, that depth no, right? Are we to interpret this as lowercase or uppercase or case, case insensitive? That's a parameter to the, to the parser. Um, if I want to quote an identifier, um, do I use double quotes like Oracle? Do I use brackets like SQL Server? That's, that's configurable in the parser. Um, We've also got, well, yeah, parser factory. So we, we've actually got multiple implementations of the parser with different subsets of the language. So we've got one parser, which for example, has DDL in it. The core parser is just select 
um, insert, update, delete. But there's an extended parser that has a DDL language. Um, there's also another parser called Babel, which is very, very permissive and understands not just Calcite's dialect of SQL, but it tries to understand everyone else's too, like Redshift and BigQuery and, and whatever. So you can control that using Parser Factory. Um, the not like operator isn't in standard SQL, but it is in Postgres and a few Postgres related systems like Redshift. So if you, if, uh, you can control that by fun equals Postgres in your JDBC connect string, which tells it to load the particular operator table that has all the Postgres functions in it. And then lastly, there are some configuration options that are used by the validator. Like if I say group by D, D is a column alias, it's not a column. Some dialects of SQL allow that, some of them don't. And similarly, what, what you can put in the order by clause. Um, so those are the parser ones. Um, so I've covered the you know, pluggable parser, lexable, conformance, and operators. But there's other aspects of dialect which occur during planning time. A good example of this is distinct count. Now, most engines support distinct count, but some of them don't. So if you if suppose CalCite is receiving a query with uh, account distinct operation in it, but its target is it wants to generate SQL for an, a backend engine that doesn't support distinct count, then CalCite has rewrite rules that will get rid of that distinct count and convert it into group buys and joins and grouping sets and other kind of lower level operations. So you can enable that particular rule to get rid of all distinct counts that occur in the query. Um, and you know you don't often use that, but it's a very powerful tool to you know completely restructure the query. Um, and then lastly, um, if we're if we're dealing with a JDBC adapter, obviously other adapters don't speak SQL, but the JDBC adapter is where the data lives in a SQL database, and we need to generate SQL in the dialect of that database. So we've got a SQL dialect class there that has a whole bunch of methods that you can override to specify what the particular capabilities of that dialect is. Um, since CalCite is open source, um, in fact, the, the fact that CalCite is open source is why we have such a broad set of dialects. Because, you know, people run CalCite and they're running against, I don't know, Exosol or whatever. And uh, CalCite doesn't have a dialect and they say, can I contribute one? And this is an important thing to know if you haven't, if you want to get started in open source, you kind of have to know how to play this game. Um, and this is kind of a textbook example of how to do it. So Charles sent an email to the CalCite dev list. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with Apache, the dev list and emailing list is basically that's the town square of an Apache project. Um, that's where all the important decisions get decided. That's, you know, the regulars show up on this list. And we try and be welcome to just new people we haven't seen before. So if you want to get involved and you want to write a feature, then send an email to the dev list saying, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you all think? And uh, in this case, Stamatis replied to the email within 12 minutes. Well done. <laughs> um, and said, hey, somebody did something similar to this for another dialect. You should just check out what they did. And in particular, what tests they added, because if you, if, you know, test driven development and all, um, if you want to implement a feature, it's really good to start off with a test and then just run that test until, you know, until it, and, until it passes and everything else passes. So this is a great kind of template to follow if you're interested in getting involved in open source. Um, so I just mentioned RHEL Builder. And so it's, since we're talking about languages, CalCite is a great platform. If you want to implement a new language that isn't SQL, I mean, I know SQL's, you know, close to perfect, but um, if you want to implement a new language, CalCite is a very good way of doing it. So analogy I sometimes use is um, uh, CalCite is kind of like the, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, what's the name of that language you use in the middle of uh, an intermediate language for compilers? 
Yeah, yeah, LLVM. So CalSite is like the LLVM of databases. So if you, if you implement a front end for CalSite, the new language, as long as you translate that language into relational algebra, um, you don't have to worry about implementing the back end. You can use one of CalSite's many back ends. So if you want to run, I mean, people have done this. People have implemented pig language. Um, they converted it to CalSite algebra, and now you can run pig on Oracle because CalSite can generate SQL for Oracle. So it's, very, it's a very powerful way of doing it. Um, I've got a few languages here, pig, data log, morel, which is a language I'm working on, like in my spare time. Um, and so this is, this is a great way of, of going about it. Um, and that's it, it's 10 to one. I think, um, I think we should have, we should take a few questions and we're happy to stay back and answer more questions later. Um, oh yeah, I wanted to cover this. So since presumably some of you are doing research, um, uh, not now obviously, but um, uh, we just wanted to give a few examples of where research is be effectively being done using CalSite as a platform. So this is a, um, a paper that I co-authored. Um, I see Fabian in the audience here. He was a co-author with me. So this was using CalSite as a um, and actually other Apache projects that are, are built on CalSite, um, extending SQL to deal with streaming. Um, so uh, Fabian is a contributor to Flink. Uh, we also had some co-authors from Apache Beam, otherwise known as Cloud Dataflow. Um, and we were just looking at the SQL language and how it could be extended in a, in a sane way um, uh, to add streaming semantics to it. Um, Another paper, this is actually at this conference this year. Uh, I think it's on Wednesday morning. Um, uh, Tempura, a general cost-based optimizer framework for incremental data processing. Similar to streaming, but it's the idea of maintaining a data warehouse incrementally. So let's suppose you've got data flowing in continuously throughout the day. You want to run some reports at midnight. Um, is how do you determine an efficient schedule to populate those report, the tables you're going to run the reports from Let's say, pop, let's say do the work incrementally every hour, as opposed to try, trying to do it all at midnight where it's gonna take four hours and you won't have enough time to populate the tables and run the reports. So similar in some ways to the work of optimizing streaming queries, but different in a lot of other ways. So uh, this was done uh, a combination between UC Irvine and uh, uh, Alibaba. Um, the advantage of, of using CalSite for research is that, as Stamatis showed, it's already a fully functional database where you can, you know, you have an already functional, fully functional database. And furthermore, it's open source, which means if you don't understand why anyone and something works, you can ask a question on the dev list and someone ex will explain to you how the statistics works or how you change, specify the selectivity of an operator or how I write a, rule, a transformation rule or whatever. So um, it's a good starting point. Um, and, uh, you know, once you've completed that project, the code doesn't have to die. Um, the Tempura folks, um, have contributed their code back to CalSite. We're going through the review process right now. It's a GitHub pull request. We're reviewing it and trying to shoehorn it into, you know, CalSite's code base in a way that other, other people will be able to use it. So that's another nice thing about this is we accept contributions and potentially what you do could become cal a part of CalSite. Uh, so that's all I have. Um, thank you for coming. And I'd love to hear if there's any questions. Thank you. Any questions? And for from our remote, uh, participants, do you have any questions to here? Yeah. So uh, let me start with a question. So um, if I have some optimization techniques that you currently do not support, uh, how easy is to integrate my new optimization rules or even a new cost-based optimizer and so on. Is uh, like a pluggable 
or I need to go to the core of CalSite and modify uh, the code to support this. So if you want to add a new transformation rule, then it depends. If it is uh, dependent only on your engine and it can work only on your engine, then it doesn't fit into CalSite. If it, it is uh, an optimization rule that can benefit, uh, let's say, at least two, people, two systems, then uh, you create, a, again, you create a zero case or you send an email to the dev list. You, pro you, you say you state your proposal and then if it's validated, then uh, of course it can in, it can be implemented in the, the core repository of CalSite. And usually you need to add a few tests in some specific class, which is a relop rule test or whatever. And then uh, it's mostly done. So you introduce your rule. If it's uh, sound, then uh, it will be incorporated. If it is only for you, then it should be kept uh, at, the at, at your repo. So it depends on the use case. Yeah, okay. And uh, following up a bit. Uh, but can, I, can I add to that? Yes. CalSite is intended as a framework. So you like, for example, Hive has its own rules. They're not part of CalSite. They're just part of Hive. And that's kind of most people that are writing CalSite rules are not contributing them to CalSite. So you don't need CalSite to accept your rules. Um, the other thing I'd say is some of some of the optimizations fit into, into the category of a rule, which is I matched you know, a filter on top of a join and therefore I want to do convert it to XYZ. But sometimes it's, you know, it doesn't fit into that category. Maybe you've got some new way of calculating statistics, right? Maybe you have a, a better way of estimating the output, the cardinality of a 10-way joint. So there's other kind of plug-in APIs inside CalSite. We haven't really talked very much about statistics here and metadata, um, but maybe what you're doing fits into one of those APIs. The, the fact that CalSite's been used to build so many systems means your the particular technique you want to use there's probably an api that you can implement to slot it in yeah okay thank you and following up a bit the question that uh, martin had about uh, the storage if it was row or column layout and you said you don't care much about the storage it's more at the processing level but the storage will influence also the processing uh, techniques you will use right and currently you have for example an executor or how is design? How easy is for me to extend it to support vectorization, for example, or integrate late materializations and so on? So, uh, I mean, from the one hand, if you, I mean, on your, when you want to optimize and you want to pick the best candidate or the best plan, then you, you are going to do it mostly by introducing new metadata. So there is a real metadata API which allows you to plug in your own, uh, let's say, information. So if you have some specific things that can apply uh, due to column store or row store, then uh, you can have a new extension to the metadata API and plug in your own uh, kind of cost. So afterwards, you can also, I mean, the cost of uh, the implementation of the cost is also extensible. So if you have a totally novel model of calculating cost, you can introduce this to the planner and you can tell the planner not to use the Volcano cost, let's say, or another cost, but use your own. So there are various extension points. And, and the idea is that if you have, uh, let's say, uh, multiple column convention and some operators that do, that access a row store and some others that access a column store, then each one could be a calling convention. So you have one calling convention that corresponds to the row store and the other that corresponds to the uh, column store. And both can, uh, can have different, com each operator can have different cost, uh, cost model. And then you combine them the way, uh, if you, the, the planner will take the best, the one that uh, with the best cost, they will choose a plan with the best cost. So you can have even both at the same time. Yeah. And, Afterwards, then uh, maybe you're asking how you can combine this uh, together. Then uh, it depends on the third kind of convention. So in this guy, in this case, the third kind of convention was enumerable. So it was kind of operators that will gather everything in memory and will do the processing there. So this, you have a separate cost model for this kind of operators. But you could have, um, instead of enumerable conversion, your combiner could be Spark. In that case, you do have a Spark-specific cost model for this kind of operators. Okay, uh, thank you for... 
Can I can I add to that? Yes. So uh, right after lunch uh, is uh, Wes McKinney's giving a tutorial on Arrow. I'm a huge fan of Arrow. I think it's you know really elegant in memory column oriented format um, that tends to bring out the best characteristics of modern CPUs. Um, and uh, it's not happened yet, but I would love to have a um, Arrow convention in CalSite so that we could take a, you know, rather than generating innumerable plans, basically generate plans that use Arrow data format and Arrow operators. And Arrow has, Arrow's working on an intermediate representation, so building in their own operators of things like hash joins, hash aggregation, sorts, and, and so forth. And I think that would be a really, a, a really beautiful integration between CalSite and, and Arrow. Um, and, you know, creates the possibility of some really, really efficient data engines because CalSite is not only doing the, you know, the, the high level operations like, you know, reordering joins and so forth, but generating a, you know, a really efficient runtime. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the answer. More questions before going to launch. And let me look at the remote audience. Uh, yeah, it seems we don't have more questions. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, thank the speakers again. Thank you.